Hello, friends and colleagues. My name is Yuri Petrov. I am from St. Petersburg State University. I am glad to present here some of our latest ideas devoted to the fundamental analogy between dynamic fracture and the simplest mass on spring model. I hope this analysis will be of special interest for experimenters as it em emphasizes the fundamental importance of the experimental study of the threshold loads, which in my opinion are still barely examined. This is the outline of the presentation. It has the following structure. Firstly, we will discuss dynamic rec initiation problems and corresponding fracture effects, mainly the unstable floating critical stress intensity value. Sometimes it exceeds static K1C, sometimes it can be lower. Next, we will discuss the incubation time fracture model, which can be used to predict the discussed effects and to solve the stated dynamic fracture problems. And finally, we will see that fracture of a linear oscillator has a lot in common with the correct initiation problem. Well, in statics, we can generally agree that the crack starts to propagate when the stress intensity factor reaches some a priori known ultimate value, K1C. This is a well-known Irwin's criterion. On the other hand, the situation when dynamic loading is involved can be far more complicated. In dynamics, the critical stress intensity value can exceed or even be lower than the K1C value. And sometimes it is unstable and depends on the way of loading of the same material. This was discovered in numerous experiments by Shoki, Kalthoff, Homma, Ravichandar and other researchers. And it was and still is a matter of uh, numerous discussions about the nature of dynamic fracture toughness. We develop an incubation time approach which allows one to understand numerous effects of dynamic fracture from the united viewpoint. In the case of quasi-brittle fracture, the approach results in a special incubation time criterion, allowing us to get the whole phenomenological picture of crack growth initiation. It means to explain and predict a number of the most important effects. They are summarized on this slide. So let's consider a situation when crack uh, faces are uh, loaded with a short pressure pulse. The load pulse can lead to uh, the crack initiation or not. Let's suppose that having the pulse amplitude P2, uh, we uh, got a, a time to fracture T star 2. In this case, stress intensity factor will grow in time up to the moment of fracture and its ultimate value turns out to be greater than static critical value K1C. Now I am asking uh, what will happen if we take and fix the time to fracture T star 2 as a pulse duration and then take a lower amplitude P1 so that now we have a short pulse of final duration T which is equal to T star 2 with the amplitude P1 that is a bit less than P2. The intuitive answer the intuitive answer is probably that there will be no fracture now and the sample will remain intact. However, the fracture will occur, but with the delay, meaning that new fracture time T star 1 is longer now than the load pulse duration T. And at the same time, the stress intensity factor decreases before the fracture moment T star 1. This way we can again go to a lower amplitude and step by step come to the threshold amplitude. In the case of threshold amplitude, fracture occurs on the decreasing stage of the stress intensity hit history and the critical stress intensity K1D, dynamic fracture toughness, turns out to be less than K1C.
finally, we will have the following temporal dependency for dynamic fracture toughness K1D. The K1D turns out to be unstable. It can acquire any value for the, from the yellow region between the threshold case lower curve and the case when the applied load acts up to the moment of fracture upper curve. Even uh, a non-monotonic dependence for K1D is possible here, as it is shown by the red curve, and it was experimentally observed by Professor Kalthoff. This is how the incubation process phenomenologically works, and it is confirmed by experiments. Uh, only two material constants are needed here, and uh, uh, there is no need for modifications of material constants into material functions in order to calculate all these effects. Now let me say just a few words about the origin of this fracture model, which is able to capture all the variety of these specular dynamic fracture effects. As I already said, it is called the incubation time fracture model, and we assume that fracture at uh, point X and time uh, T takes place if this inequality holds. Here, sigma of X and T is a studied time dependent Turing stress acting on some area, and sigma C on the right side is the ultimate static stress for the studied material. The criterion also contains two other parameters, d and uh, tau. The d parameter characterizes the considered scale level of fracture. For example, minimal crack elongation considered as a fracture on the given scale, so that all the fracture events that result in new surfaces with the characteristic size smaller than d are not considered as fracture on the given scale. The fracture at the selected scale is regarded as a result of particular preparatory processes, such as development of microcracks and voids and their coalescence. Obviously, those are relaxation processes, require some specific characteristic time to take place, and this time is considered as a material property and is called the incubation time. These processes lead to stress relaxation, and thus the incubation time can be understood as a characteristic time of relaxation. Technically, these processes are accounted for using integration with respect to time. The fracture process is quantized, and uh, uh, we introduce both characteristic size and characteristic time of the fracture process. It is important that both parameters are related to the given scale level. Here we use a simplified version of the criterion, which deals with the stress intensity factor function. This version is applicable for the crack initiation problems only and should not be used for the crack propagation studies. Now let's uh, turn to a particular problem of the crack uh, loaded with the short pulse. We will study an infinite plane with the semi-infinite crack loaded with the pressure pulse. The problem can be formulated using well-known potential-based wave equations with the appropriate boundary and initial conditions. First, we solve the problem of the sudden application of constant pressure to the crack faces. In this case, the load is described by a heavy side step function. This is a very important case since uh, the solution of this problem can be used to obtain a solution for an arbitrary load using convolution integral. Then we can easily deduce the problem solution for a short pulse load case. This stress intensity K of T function can now be substituted into the fracture criterion. 
we did the analysis and it turns out that the fracture can occur at various stages of stress intensity function according to the incubation time model. Depending on the pulse characteristics, the starting stress intensity factor value can be less than equal to or exceed the static ultimate stress intensity value. Moreover, the fracture can take place when the stress intensity factor value starts to decrease, which was noticed in experimental works by Schocke and Kalthoff. We can use the incubation time fracture criterion to analyze two representative cases. Fracture with maximum fracture time and therefore maximum delay and the case when there is no delay and fracture time equals to the load pulse duration T. For each pulse amplitude value A, we can look for a corresponding critical SIE value leading to either delay or no delay cases and this way we construct two curves. As you can see, the maximum delay curve is below the static fracture toughness. This happens due to the fracture delay effect which is captured by the incubation time model. Another case, the no delay fracture is in fact a situation of an overload leading to the critical SIF value growth. It is also interesting to construct the dependence of the load momentum on the pulse amplitude. The momentum is simply a product of the load pulse duration T and pulse amplitude A. Again, we can consider two situations, a maximum fracture time case equal to the maximum fracture delay and the no delay case when fracture time equals the load pulse duration. Obviously, the lowest pulse momentum is required if we allow the fracture delay, the lower dashed curve. This is generally an optimal situation, but it is probably hard to implement experimentally. It is practically much easier to apply the load and uh, to wait till the fracture occurs, meaning that we are in the no delay situation, which is described by the upper curve. But the no delay upper curve also appears to have a minimum, providing optimal load momentum with the lowest value. It can be very important for the fracture process optimization needed for industrial applications. At least it is very important to be aware that the optimum does exist. And now I come to the central point of this work. One of the most interesting things related to this model is the existence of a fundamental analogy between the above mentioned results and the behavior of a linear oscillator. Now let's turn to a seemingly completely different problem, which I will prove appears to be surprisingly similar to the just discussed crack problem. Consider a, a linear oscillator subjected to two load types, a linearly rising load and a short pulse load. These two load types can be used to study two dynamic fracture effects, the dependence of the system strength on the loading rate and the fracture delay case, which is of the highest interest for us. First, uh, let's have a look at the rising load problem. For such a simple system, we can easily solve the motion equation and obtain the dependence of the mass position on time. Further, this solution can be analyzed using a very simple fracture condition. The spring breaks when critical elongation Xc is reached. For different rates alpha, we can calculate corresponding critical load force values at the fracture moment. It appears that for the lower loading rates, the critical force equals the static critical force at the fracture time. But for high loading rates, the critical force exceeds significantly the static critical value, providing a so-called dynamic branch of the strength rate dependency curve. Uh, 
The result can be actually proven by the solution analysis. Now let's consider the short pulse load. The oscillator is loaded with the force pulse uh, with duration T and amplitude A. Again, we easily obtain the motion law for the mass solving the corresponding differential equation. Using the same critical elongation fracture condition, we can construct dependence of the load pulse duration T on the fracture time T star for a fixed pulse amplitude A. The constructed uh, curve clearly shows the fracture delay phenomenon and two representative cases emerge the no delay case when fracture time T star equals the pulse duration T it is a vertical line here and the maximum delay case when the fracture occurs after the load abruptly ends For these two cases, we can obtain dependencies of the fracture pulse duration on the pulse amplitude. The lower curve on the left graph describes fracture pulses with uh, longest fracture time T star, and therefore the longest fracture delay. And the upper curve describes the no delay case. Interestingly, we have an asymptotic describing the lowest admissible amplitude for the fracture pulse, which is twice lower than the static critical force. In fact, all the fracture pulses lie in the dark gray zone between the no delay and the maximal delay curves. The points from the region above the upper no delay curve should be regarded as dropped to the upper curve as the system fails before the load finishes. Now, when we have dependencies of the amplitudes on the durations for the fracture pulses, we can explore the momentums of these loads. The load momentum is the product of the amplitude and duration, and on the right you may see dependence of the fracture load momentum on the load amplitude for both cases, no delay and maximal delay situations. The upper no delay curve appears to have a minimum which provides optimum fracture load in terms of momentum. And uh, it looks absolutely identical to what we had in the crack problem. Now just uh, let's put our crack cross initiation problem and spring breaking problem in one slide. The momentum versus amplitude dependence appears to be nearly identical providing minimal points for the no delay situations. We can see that uh, the crack appears to behave uh, very similarly to the mass on spring when subjected to pulse loads. Both rate dependencies and delayed threshold phenomena can be found and juxtaposed in these two seemingly different problems. The existence of optimal characteristics is also predicted in both cases. Obviously, the threshold situations should be studied more carefully in fracture dynamics, which is not done yet nowadays. So we have a very beautiful analogy which emphasizes the fundamental nature of the phenomenological approach predicted numerous effects by taking into account the preparatory incubation process. The analogy also shows us that crack dynamics can be analyzed by means of putting into consideration the notions of effective mass and effective stiffness, which are going to be subjects of future research. Here are the conclusions. The incubation time criterion for cracks has a simple mess on spring interpretation. Fracture delay and various initial or critical stress intensity factors can be predicted and there is no need for material functions. There is an optimal input momentum for the practically convenient no delay case. Cracks behave similarly to oscillators 
exhibiting mass and stiffness which can be evaluated. The analogy emphasizes the fundamental importance of the experimental study of the threshold situations which are still barely examined. Thank you, colleagues, for your attention.